Testing, testing. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I wanted to start off with a provocative picture and title, so I hope this fits the bill. Um, if you can't quite make it up, this is a cemetery with a cell tower on the land. So I think there's a metaphor in there somewhere, and I hope you'll get that flavor a little bit from me tonight. I don't want to be necessarily anxiety provoking or alarmist, but there is some reason, I believe, to be aware of this and to have some concern and take some precaution in our daily lives. So Will that affect them with the resurrection? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's studied that yet. <laughs> Do we know where the cemetery is? Um, I could probably disclose that later off, right. off the recording. Yeah. I don't want to be buried there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can take cell phone with you. <laughs> get, <laughs> get great reception. Have interactions usually during our talks. Since this is being recorded, if maybe we could hold our questions until the end of the recording session so that um, it'll be a clean video for whoever needs to see it in the future. Let's make sure that's recording. I have a new camera. I got to make sure it's working correctly. Okay. So yes, perfect. We'll uh, do Q&A at the end. So if you'll just write those down or save them in your memory banks as they come up. I'm going to cover a lot of ground tonight. I apologize. There's a lot to say about this issue to get you up to speed. That's why I'm recording it. I'll, I'll put it up on YouTube in the near future so you could have it as a reference or for review. Um, and if I could ask one favor of you all, if you could put your cell phones into airplane mode, um, that will help reduce the radiation in the room and you'll probably get more from the presentation. You'll probably be able to hold on to a little bit more in your brain. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, I would appreciate it. And before we get rolling, just a little bit about myself. I'm an Oregon native. I hope that might get me some brownie points with some of you all. Um, I'm certified by the Building Biology Institute. You've probably never heard of that. That's okay. I'll touch on that in a minute. Basically, my work is to identify and remediate exposures to electromagnetic radiation, primarily in the home, but also commercial, in vehicles, in different places where we spend time. I serve the Pacific Northwest. I've been doing that since 2017. And I'm also a member of a nonprofit, Oregon for Safer Technology, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. And we also have Marsha in the back. Marsha, give a wave from Oregon for Safer Technology. So we'll be available to talk about that and answer any questions afterwards. So what the heck is building biology? Well, this is a discipline that came over from Germany in the 80s from a renowned architect. And essentially the mission is to create healthy spaces, healthy homes, healthy schools from indoor air quality problems, water pollutants, uh, toxic building materials, and of course, electromagnetic radiation. You want that one off too? I was just saying lighting, healthy lighting. Yeah, yes. And healthy lighting, which is the part of this all. Um, so building biologists like myself, we work with the general public. We also work with professionals like a naturopath, a doctor, a real estate agent, a contractor, an electrician, to help everyone see the interrelationship between the natural world and the built world and, and how important that connection is. But I wasn't always a building biologist. I wasn't always that, that guy in the right top right corner there waving strange equipment around in the air. Uh, so how did I get there? Well, in the lower right, you can see my former life as a firefighter paramedic. And that was a career that I fought hard to get into and it took many years was very expensive going back to school, lots of sacrifice, lots of sacrifice on my family's part, and I finally got in, and it was amazing. And then I got sick. I essentially began to break down mentally, physically, emotionally. I think we all have a sense that the world of first responders is pretty demanding, and this was something beyond that, which I later became uh, aware of it is, it's called electrosensitivity, and I became electrosensitive. All of the technology, communications devices, being up all hours of the night under artificial lighting, high stress, 
so many things that played into it. It got bad enough to the point that I actually had to leave that field that I had fought so hard to get into, and it was really heartbreaking. Um, just a few years after that, my mom, who's in the middle, contracted an aggressive form of brain cancer called glioblastoma. And from time of her diagnosis to her passing was less than eight months. And it was incredibly tragic. She um, was 73 years young, had a lot of love and life to give to her family, and was gone too soon. In considering her life and her relationship with technology after she passed, some things became clear to me. The way she was using technology, always talking on the phone with it up to her ear, iPad under her pillow on her bed, power line 20 feet outside of her bedroom window. Some things started to click into place for me about this EMF stuff that I had been learning about. And at that point, I, I had to do something about it. I had to help make other people aware so they could avoid the kinds of things that had happened to me. That's when I found the Building Biology Institute became certified and started doing this work. Uh, more recently, you can see my daughters on the left who are my absolute joy and terror sometimes. <laughs> and as they enrolled into the public school system, I became increasingly concerned about the amount of time that they were exposed to Wi-Fi, wireless radiation, during the school day. And so I had an opportunity to join a local nonprofit which I mentioned, and we'll get to a little bit more about that later, to try and help influence the public, parents, school administrators, city councils, and so on, about the dangers of wireless radiation. So what are we talking about with EMF, electromagnetic frequencies and radiation? Well, you may have seen a slide like this in a high school physics class, perhaps, but this is the electromagnetic spectrum as we know it. These are the various forms that energy takes as it goes from point A to point B in the universe. You can see there's a whole continuum, different wavelengths, frequencies. <clears throat> and the important thing to say here is that there are natural EMF frequencies that whatever you believe about evolution have been here longer than we have. And then there are anthropogenic or human-made, electronically generated EMFs which have only been around 130 years or so. So that's a key difference. And on the bottom of the slide are some different examples of devices you might see in everyday life and where they sit on this timeline. Um, I understand Dr. Martin Paul made a presentation recently, and I was able to review his slides, uh, which were outstanding, fascinating, very granular into the, the biophysics of this all. I wanted to just reiterate and stress um, one point he made that I think is really important. I'm going to kind of paraphrase his slide <clears throat> on my notes here. But this has to do with the difference between natural EMF and human-made EMF. And he said uh, electronically generated EMF or human EMF uh, are generated in a coherent state at a specific frequency, vector, phase, and polarity. So all aspects of the wave are engineered to do something and to be directed in a certain way, to send or receive information, to send power to your kitchen, etc. So the more coherent an EMF is, the stronger the byproduct, this radiation, is coming off of it. And by contrast, um, natural EMFs, he says, are composed of astronomical numbers of individual photons emitted in different vector directions, different phases, different polarities, and sometimes but not always the same, same frequency. So instead of that focus, purpose-driven source of radiation, natural, like sunlight, are a little more dispersed, a little more random. I'm probably not using the correct word, but as a result, they're not as focused and they don't have as big of a radiation downside. So I hope I didn't uh, hurt your brain there. Trying to understand Dr. Paul hurts mine a little bit sometimes. But we have natural EMF and we have human-made EMF. So that's a very important distinction here. So I'm going to cut right to the chase. How does EMF radiation impact our health? And although this concept might be new to some of you, it's actually been studied going back into the 1930s. 
This is um, just a, a copy of a document that was produced by NASA where they translated uh, some scientific research from Russia from the 1930s. And the Russians got wind of this first, and in this hundred of pa hundreds of page, pages document, they outline dozens of body systems and hundreds of impacts from various types of EMF radiation. So this has been actually known quite a long time. More recently, a group of scientists came together. It's called the Bioinitiative Report. Scientists, doctors, um, researchers, and they had combed through the available literature on EMF radiation and health, negative health impacts. And they basically had seen enough and they wanted to put a statement out. So that's what Bioinitiative Report is. It has um, detailed notes and lists of all the studies that they looked at, a multi-page um, position paper on their thoughts as well as some color-coded charts which show different levels of exposure and the various body systems or effects that they had. This has been updated in 2017 and 2022 and was kind of a big splash in the world. It was, it was one of the first times that a group, a group of scientists had come together and said, there's a problem here. Um, even more recently, the prestigious National Toxicology Program spent 14 years and $30 million studying the effects of wireless radiation from what at the time was current technology, 2G and 3G cell phones. And they studied the effect on rats in the lab and mice in the lab. And the, the main finding, the big, the big tagline is clear evidence of cancer, heart, and DNA damage in these uh, test subjects in the lab. And those same types of heart and brain cancers have also been found in long-term studies of cell phone users, so 10 plus years. So this was a big alarm bell that came out in 2018. Uh, just to shift gears a little bit with how EMF impacts our health, I thought this slide would be helpful. We don't always think of light as being an EMF, but of course, human-made light is everywhere now, right? And it, it doesn't match the sun. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But this shows the changes in uh, lighting at night across recent decades from top left down to bottom right. And you can see that um, they're projecting by 2025 in most of the country, you won't even be able to see the Big Dipper at night outside with your naked eye. And so stargazing is one thing, that's a concern, but this light comes into our homes through the cracks in the windows. Um, it comes into our eyes when we're outside at night. And this tricks our bodies. It disrupts our circadian timing, the 24-hour cycle of light and dark, light and dark. I'll touch on that a little bit more later. But this is another way that EMF is spreading rapidly and impacting our world and our health. As this technology has become more ubiqu ubiquitous in the environment, Many people have begun to experience a syndrome which is now known as electromagnetic hypersensitivity, EHS sometimes, or electrosensitivity, like what I experienced in the firefighting world. Uh, it's a multi-system medical condition. You can see the symptoms here, and it's all associated with human-made EMF exposure. Many people reach a biological tipping point where they've been just fine in their daily life, not experiencing any particular sensitivity, and then very suddenly they're experiencing debilitating symptoms. And, and sometimes that can coincide with utility smart meters being installed in a community, a new cell tower going up, uh, bringing in a new piece of technology or a new cell phone into your home and your life, and the switch is flipped, and your body is no longer able to compensate against this artificial energy in your environment. Some researchers estimate that around a third of the population in a given country experience mild to moderate symptoms of this electrosensitivity. Uh, it's got to the point where people are crying out actually and on the, the left hand portion of this slide you can see some instances where people have been have uh, filed for accommodation and disability claim in their work and have been granted that, which is a really positive step for raising awareness about this. 
and helping people who are suffering. Um, and then Sweden was way ahead of the curve on this. And in the year 2000, they recognized electrosensitivity as a functional impairment and started accommodating and taking care of people who were suffering from this. So the next topic I want to take you to is an important one. And children are not necessarily little adults. There's actually some key differences in, in the ways that EMF affect them. This slide really says it all. It compares <clears throat> a five-year-old, 10-year-old, an adult, uh, and the radiation that they absorb. And a child, a five-year-old, will absorb approximately twice as much radiation from a cell phone than an adult. And there's a few reasons for this. Number one, they have thinner skulls, which is a protective wall, essentially, to this type of radiation. They have unmyelinated brains. Myelination is an insulation on the pathways inside your brain. It's not fully developed and finished until your mid-20s or so. And uh, tangential to this slide, kids have a lifetime of exposure. For most of us in this room, we didn't have a cell phone in our hands by age four. But many kids today do. We didn't have Wi-Fi when we went to this uh, elementary school. But many kids do now. And so the longer you are able to be exposed to this environmental type of stressor, the more chances you have for your body to develop, go from an inflammation state to a disease state, develop a cancer, neurodegeneration, fertility issues, and so on. Also in recent decades, we've seen a sharp increase in the rate of autism. And there may be some changes that have occurred in how we diagnose and detect that. There's some concern with vaccines and other environmental toxins. But what else has increased exponentially in the last few decades? EMF, wireless radiation in particular from our cell phones and other technologies. So I think there's something there. Uh, beyond the cellular impact, negative impact of wireless radiation, there's also, as many of you are probably aware, a pretty dark side behaviorally wise uh, from screen time and from the things that you're exposed to, like social media, when you're staring at a screen. A couple of studies here on the screen. Uh, the one on the left was a review of different studies out there looking at the effects of screen time. They found increased stress and anxiety, sleep issues, cardiovascular and obesity uh, risk factors, depression, suicidal tendencies, hyperarousal, where you're just ramped up, you can't calm down, you can't go to sleep, you're agitated, um, and then just general device dependence. And then the one on the right, you know, this is really alarming, but the amount of time that a pregnant mother spends on her cell phone has some significant downstream effects on the child in terms of ADHD and hyperactivity. So um, definitely some concerns with children and they're not, not the same as adults and not impacted the same way as adults. This should really make the light bulb go off in your head, I hope, but there's been a number of articles in the last 15 years about uh, the tech, tech elites and how they restricted their kids from using their own products. And I would encourage you to, to Google something like this or, or read into this article and, and see how they knew that there was concern, reason to be precautious, reason to limit use in their ch by their children of the devices that they were producing. And just to finish this section off, I want to read something from American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, quote, children are not little adults and are disproportionately impacted by all environmental exposures, including cell phone radiation. Current FCC standards do not account for the unique vulnerability and use patterns specific to pregnant women and children. It is essential that any new standard for cell phones or other wireless devices be based on protecting the youngest and most vulnerable populations to ensure they are safeguarded throughout their lifetimes. Next, let's look at, is the government adequately protecting us from EMF? I could probably just show you this slide and move on to the next section. But this is uh, not the best quality, but 
This is a cell tower disguised as a tree, 100 feet from an elementary school. You can see the playground equipment in the, the bottom of the shot here. And this really tells us a lot about the way the government looks at this and uh, looks at our health in light of what I've said previously about some of the studies and research done. <clears throat> this is a comparison of uh, exposure limits for this type of radiation, radio frequency radiation it's called sometimes, but it means wireless radiation. And the USA is at the top of the heap, but not in a good way. We have the highest uh, exposure allowance of pretty much any country in the world. And even, even worse, even further, this was a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, but they were saying that approximately one in 10 cell phone towers exceeds the FCC guideline limits due to malfunction, malfeasance, we don't know what, but that adds up to about 30,000 cell towers in the country that are exceeding the radiation limits. This is hurting school kids, this is hurting neighborhoods, this is hurting the workers that go up on those towers. It's a big deal. So this was another interesting article. Um, the National Business Post, basically they were looking at real estate values, property values, when cell towers or power lines go in. And the takeaway from the article was that it can decrease property values by as much as 20%. And in this picture is what's called a small cell 5G antenna. And as I'll touch on a little bit later, some of the characteristics of the 5G infrastructure, they have to be placed much, much closer to our homes, and in some cases every block or so. So these are going to be popping up right in front of homes. And there's another um, new bit of legislation called OTARD, over the air radiation or reception device. And it basically allows sending and receiving antennas to be placed on street corners, um, within multi-unit apartment complexes, without any type of notice or appeal process or any way for someone living there to say, no, I don't want this, this is a problem. So some big concerns with the rollout of 5G, which we'll touch on. Havana syndrome, has anybody heard of that in the news? So this is not actually the first time that um, we have suspected microwave radiation being used in a weaponized form. Actually, the first was back in the, the 70s in the Moscow signal. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, I'll, for, for brevity's sake, I'll, I'll just stick to Havana syndrome tonight. But starting in 2016, U.S. diplomats in Havana, Cuba, were reporting some serious ailments, um, painful ringing in the head, um, in the ears. They actually had concussion-like symptoms, but no head trauma, um, cognitive difficulties, and it kept happening and kept happening and kept happening. And so it's been a multi-year investigation. It has since spread to Europe, um, Asia, even domestically in Washington, D.C., diplomats, mil military personnel. So it's a big problem. They have been researching it, and uh, the theory right now is that it is weaponized microwave radiation. And when it hits the brain, it actually, when it hits your, your head, it actually turns into a sonic shockwave which disturbs your inner ear and is uh, negatively impacting of the brain tissue itself. So this is sort of ironic that uh, the government seems to not even be able to protect its diplomats and military personnel in this regard. Furthering the case, this is a great article in uh, The Nation. You can look it up. And it basically talks about how the wireless industry, or, or big wireless, is just pulling pages out of the tobacco playbook, which for years and years, you know, they had a, a very concise um, playbook that they would go to of denial, of purchasing science that spoke to their narrative, and a number of other tactics to confuse the issue. Um, some of you may have seen doctors in Life magazine in the 30s and 40s advertising for their favorite band of, of cigarettes. And it's not too far removed from that with wireless technology today. So I'd encourage you to, to check this article out. Along those lines, um, 
with science and, and purchasing research. Uh, a researcher at the University of Washington, Dr. Henry Lai, looked at about 250 studies on wireless radiation and he broke them apart by those that had ties to industry or industry funding and those that did not. And there is a significant difference, as you can see on the screen. Those that were tied to industry found the harmful effect about a third of the time. Those that were not tied to industry, 70% of the time. So how do we explain that, right? Um, just a month ago, two months ago, ProPublica put out an excellent article along these lines. This is the title and the, the screenshot of it. I would also encourage you to read that. But it basically talks about how the FCC has um, a relationship with Big Wireless and actually a revolving door uh, with them. This, this is another slide on it. Here's a book about it, about this revolving door. And it, it basically tells us that the fox is in the hen house and that the people trying to govern wireless industry and wireless radiation are just going back and forth to the very companies they're supposed to be regulating. So massive conflict of interest and another way that the government is letting us down. There is some good news in all of this, okay? I don't want to be all doom and gloom for you tonight. Uh, just, just in the last couple of years, the FCC got a big slap on the wrist where they had chosen to not update their radiation exposure standards from 1996, and they gave no reasoning. They just said, no, technology hasn't changed that much since 1996, right? So we should probably just let them off the hook. Uh, the court said that their failure to update was capricious and arbitrary, was not evidence-based, and so now they have to provide some type of explanation as to why they're not protecting the environment, children, long-term exposure of citizens. So this is really good news. And just to, to zero it in a little bit, there is a lot that we can do on a grassroots basis, coming together, working together. Um, I've got a couple of, of instances of that here, but it really is powerful when people make their voices heard and come together. Los Angeles County right now is, uh, their city council is considering public input against this fast-tracked rollout of 5G infrastructure where basically the wireless companies are, are trying to push legislation through and ordinance through where the public has no ability to be notified ahead of the tower placement, no environmental reviews to be performed, and no rights to appeal. So there's a big pushback right now. Here in the state, uh, is anybody familiar with Oregon State Bill or Senate Bill 283? Probably not, didn't get a ton of publicity, but this was a great step and then it, it fell flat on its face. The OHA was tasked through this legislation to review the research on wireless radiation, particularly as it pertained to uh, the classroom setting and students and they were told they couldn't use industry funded studies and a number of other parameters many of which they broke, many of the early drafts of the report they scrubbed, and essentially they released something on New Year's Eve at, I think, 6 p.m. or something like that, so that nobody would notice, uh, and it said, there's no concern here, no problem whatsoever from wireless being in the classroom. And this received significant international criticism from scientists and researchers. Unfortunately, the OHA has yet to have been pushed to retract the report. And this is a concern because um, other states are going to look at this. This is really the first of its kind that's been done. So other states are going to look to Oregon for guidance on this. And unfortunately, at this point, we have a, a scientific sham to share with them. So uh, groups like Oregon for Safer Technology that Marcia and I work in are pushing to get some senators to come together and get this report retracted and or redone. Uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, the citizens began complaining of serious health concerns and ailments when a new Verizon tower went in. They went to the city council. The city council heard them, supported them, and issued a cease and desist order to Verizon, which worked temporarily until the, the Verizon war chest was opened. But it, it shows how we can make noise, we can push back, we can 
give these companies some trouble and make them rethink what they're doing. Um, currently, Arthur Furstenberg and his group in New Mexico are preparing to make that the first, um, <clears throat> the first state without smart meters. So that's huge, and that would be amazing if they can pull it off. So that's happening. And um, again, close to home, Ashland is on the cusp of being the first city in Oregon to adopt city ordinances that would give the people and the city council power to push back against excessive and rampant rollout of wireless infrastructure. So some really encouraging news here. And if we raise our voices, if we come together, I believe we can make a difference on this key issue. And uh, with that, I just want to talk about Oregon for Safer Technology mm -hmm. for a brief minute. So we were established in 2012. We are 100% volunteer at this point. We are dedicated to raising awareness on the issue of microwave radiation and its impacts on health. We focus primarily on schools, on governments, on um, parents and pregnant mothers. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. And uh, we have the, the great blessing of scientific advisement from Dr. Paul, who many of you uh, know from his recent presentation. But we really need help. We're trying to grow. We're trying to make an impact. We're trying to expand our efforts. And it takes money. It takes people. It takes volunteering. It takes skill sets. Um, if, if you have time to donate, to sign up on our email list in the back, if you have previous nonprofit experience and would like to help out, we would just love that if you would take a minute to come chat with uh, Marsha or myself afterwards. So we can continue our efforts. All right, so we've been zoomed out a little bit, 30,000 foot view on the issue. I want to start bringing it more practical and into our homes and what we can do to actually protect ourselves in our homes since the government isn't doing a very good job of it. But to do that, I want to unpack what I mean when I say different types of EMFs real quick. So there are four main types, and they're on the screen. We have artificial lighting. We have radio frequency, which anytime you see that, it means microwaves, it means wireless. And then we have two that are related to the power delivery in and around our homes, electric and magnetic fields. And I would say to you that these are all environmental toxins on a level with asbestos, radon, with lead in the drinking water, and even with mold. These are all equivalent environmental stressors that people are being exposed to. So the first type of EMF, artificial light. So obviously we have uh, all kinds of different light bulbs and lighting devices and screens and car headlights and street lamps these days, but the fact is they don't match the sun, which is the gold standard, and these bulbs have only been around decades, and again, whatever you believe about evolution, the sun has been here before we were. So it's really the gold standard. The artificially produced light bulbs that, that we've made have a flicker. If you take a slow motion video with your cell phone and play it back, you will see this imperceptible flicker. The sun does not flicker. And this has been linked to seizure-like conditions, to migraines, and energy efficiency actually, with technology, in many cases can mean dirty electricity, which I'll touch on in a little bit. But these are some of the, the main problems with artificial lighting. So um, before I get to radio frequency, which is kind of a big one, let's talk about the, the next two, which are electric and magnetic fields. And the first one is AC electric or alternating current electric. You can think of this field, this type of radiation coming off of a wire or a power cord to a blender, um, kind of like a garden hose, one of those soaker hoses where there's water pressure in the hose and it's starting to seep out a little bit. It's not flowing, but it's in the hose, it's pressurized. That's kind of what this type of radiation, what this type of EMF is akin to. And uh, the device, if it's a lamp or a blender, it doesn't even have to be turned on. It just has to be plugged into power. And this goes for the wiring and the walls. 
and the power lines outside that are electrically charged. Um, the more voltage we have on a line, the farther this radiation is going to stretch out into the environment. So power lines, electrical wiring, appliances, um, equipment that plugs in. This type of VMF is generally easy to shield or reduce. On the other side of this coin, the twin sister of this EMF is the magnetic field, and this is quite different. Um, this, is, this type of radiation comes from current flow. So now the hose is spraying water. Water is moving down the hose, and this type of radiation is a byproduct. So you can see these bands of radiation coming off perpendicularly with this power line, for example, as the current flows down the line. Um, so power lines, like I said, electrical wiring in your walls, a motor, a fan, things that spin can all produce a magnetic field. And it is very powerful. It cuts through most modern building materials with ease. So it can be difficult to shield or reduce. Uh, related to these are dirty electricity, which I mentioned. And you can think of this as noise or transient electricity that rides on top of the 60 hertz sine wave that we have in this country for power delivery from the utility. But in this picture, you can see how fuzzy it is in comparison to the 60 hertz sine wave. And this fuzz, this noise, this dirty electricity is produced by our modern electronics, by the power supplies to our computers, um, LED light bulbs, dimmer switches, variable speed pumps for your HVAC, for your pool. Uh, it's produced from a lot of different sources. Thankfully, it is relatively easy to mitigate and reduce. Okay, so the, the last category of EMF is a big one. It's that radio frequency, which means wireless. And this is 5G, it's 4G, Wi-Fi, the radio, um, even newer technology like Starlink, Bluetooth, um, location, GPS, near field communication where you put your phone by the, the credit card machine at Starbucks and pay. Um, all of these wireless signals that are being sent around us Smart devices, right? Smart thermostats, uh, smart refrigerators, smart doorbells, all of these things are sending and receiving a signal wirelessly. When I go into homes these days to help clients identify their EMF issues, I'm generally finding 15, many of which they don't even know are wireless. So it's getting more and more prevalent. It's harder and harder to find uh, a new TV or a new washer dryer that doesn't have this built in. So it's a huge growing problem. And it's really hard to get your mind around it, but this type of electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave oscillates up and down thousands to billions of times per second. Just think about that type of energy in a coherent, focused manner inside your home. It's very intense. This extremely loud, busy chart is the spectrum allocation for wireless for the US. Each box in color represents a different part of our society, be it the government or the military or the weather or consumer, whatever it might be. But the point is the airwaves are chock full in the last 30 years of this type of radiation. And I want to take a, a second out here for talking about the elephant in the room, something you've probably heard about. 5G. Anybody heard about 5G? Okay, so what the heck does 5G mean? Well, it, it means the fifth generation of wireless technology. Remember once upon a time when you had your cell phone, but it couldn't do apps and data? And then all of a sudden the new cell phones came out and you could do apps and data? That was 2G to 3G. And we've since gone to 4G, and now we're staring down the barrel of 5G. So what they want to do with 5G is the Internet of Things. Millions and millions of devices that are connected wirelessly, sending and receiving information. A colleague of mine likes to say it this way, that once the Internet of Things is here, your fridge will be able to sense that the milk is low, send an automatic order to Amazon, and the milk will be delivered within two hours on your front porch by a drone. That's what we're talking about with the Internet of Things. So it might sound appealing or interesting or cool on its face, 
but there's some serious downside here. And here's a tweet from Elon Musk, who is obviously extremely pro-tech. And he's basically saying, this Internet of Things is a bad idea, guys. It's opening us up to malicious hackers and things happening where websites get drowned out in um, all these devices communicating with them and, and other types of glitches and issues in our society. So that tells us a lot if a pro-tech like Elon Musk is saying, whoa, whoa, hey, let's pump the brakes here a little bit on this, this Internet of Things thing. What are the other concerns with 5G? Um, let's start in the top left. So phased arrays and beam forming are new ways in which this type of radiation is being employed, whereby it is extremely focused. Multiple antennas within a cell tower can focus in on you and your cell phone so that data can be sent faster. But what that means, if, if you remember back to when I was talking about what Dr. Paul said about coherence, it is even more focused now kind of like that laser beam that came out of the Death Star in Star Wars, right? <laughs> yep. So uh, it's, it's a completely new way of deploying the radiation versus what we've seen before. Like I said earlier, millions of new antennas, yes, millions, every few blocks. Because 5G uses new higher frequencies, it doesn't transmit as far, especially through buildings and off obstacles and even weather. Um, fog or rain in the air. So they have to put these antennas much, much closer, and we're going to need <clears throat> millions more of them. That means closer to our homes and places of work, and, and we saw what that does to property values earlier. Um, wrapping around on the bottom, Elon Musk, who we just invoked, is one of a few companies uh, that are putting thousands and thousands of satellites into space that will deliver this type of radiation essentially to every square inch of the globe. That's what they can do right now. So this is really concerning for those of us that might want to say, hey, that's cool if you guys have your, your 5G over there, but I want to go take a walk in the woods and not be hit by this artificial stuff. Well, that's going to be harder and harder to do. Uh, wrapping around the horn here, all of these new inter millions of interconnected devices, like your toaster and your thermostat and whatever, Hackable, data privacy, right? All of these things are collecting information about us. Did we give consent? Do we know where it's going? Do we know how it's being used? No, we don't. Um, new additional frequencies beyond the range that we have now for, for most wireless communication up into the 29, 48, and on gigahertz, which is billions of oscillations per second, like I said. Uh, and then at the top there, we, we don't know what the long-term health impacts are going to be. We don't have any reason to think it's going to be helpful to us. There have been some initial studies. Dr. Paul has, has looked at a few um, and done some theoretical work. Uh, but it's really unknown. And unfortunately, industry is pushing this out without any sense of precaution, without any sense of doing the research ahead of time. So 5G. Big concern, big concern. Um, also, this was interesting, it came across my radar, but a PhD researcher, uh, Dr. Magda Havas, and um, a few others on her team looked at severity of COVID and uh, early adoption or prevalence of 5G in uh, country and by county and state, and they did Multiple linear regressions, they did a very good job. I'd encourage you to, to find the study and read it. But they uh, looked at confounding factors like air quality, population density, some socioeconomic stuff, to try and get a real feel on um, if 5G was having some type of effect on COVID. And uh, I'll just read here what they said. But um, without 5G exposure, COVID case and death rates would be 18 to 30% lower for states and 39 to 57% lower for counties. So the places that had 5G had COVID statistically significantly worse. Um, so they go on to say that, and they said the mechanism of all this, should it be a causal relationship, may relate to changes in blood chemistry, oxidative stress, 
impaired immune response and altered cardiovascular or neurological response. So a lot of the research has shown how wireless radiation and EMF impacts our immune systems and other body systems. And 5G is just being added on top of all that is already here. So our immune systems are already under attack from this type of radiation. And 5G is just, is just more weight on, on, the, on the camel's back. So this was a very interesting study that I'd encourage you to take a look at. So the big question, and um, is 5G in Salem? It definitely is. So this is from a website called nperf.com. It's a very good resource, very good tool. You can pull up anywhere in the world. And it's user-reported data, so users that have 5G-capable phones, when they get a signal, 5G signal, it reports, and then the data is, is collated and collected onto this map. So um, you can see downtown is, is saturated. They've retrofitted 5G onto all the existing macro towers. The big, big 4G towers now have 5G antennas on them, and all the main thoroughfares in and out. So it is definitely here. Uh, this is what it can look like. There's, there's a number uh, of different types of these antennas, but you can see in the left there, it's kind of a tripod up on the telephone pole. There's a little brain down below it. Uh, the lower left, that's called a strand mount antenna, which would be you know crossing an intersection on a city street. Uh, this is in southeast Portland. You can see the, the brown canister on top of the telephone pole and then the brain down here sometimes it'll look like that. This is an existing 4G tower, and the, the big masts here, those are for the 4G or the LTE, and these little ones are, are new radio, these are 5G. So these are some, uh, some ways that it can manifest. So it can be kind of concerning to think about this, but this slide shows us that the rollouts of these generations of technology, they take some time, you know, a decade or more to be fully released. I would say we're kind of more of a, a 4.1G right now, um, and, and 5G is going to take more years to have the full feature set rolled out. So we have some time, although the intensity and the frequencies are going to increase, but we have some time um, to work with groups like Oregon for Safer Technology, to start up a conversation with your legislator, with your city councils, um, to talk to other people, so just to do what you can, the more people that raise their voices, uh, the better. And we have a chance of pumping the brakes on this, this rollout of 5G. Um, it also gives us time to you know, work with a professional like myself on, well, what can I do in my home? How can I protect my home? Or you know, if I have a 5G tower down the street, you know, what specifically do I need to do about that? And there are very effective shielding measures that we can take to protect our homes from 5G. So just to review, the, the four types of EMF categories, we've got light, we've got radio frequency, and then we've got electric and magnetic. Okay, so now <clears throat> we're really gonna get, get practical, get into our homes. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up here shortly. I just have kind of a top <laughs> 10 list, if you will, of what you can do. This is definitely one thing you shouldn't do. I know this can be a little anxiety provoking to hear about this new thing and see this research and all this 5G, and, but this isn't going to help anybody. Um, I work in this every day. I work with people in their homes every day. I have all kinds of tricks and tips and techniques to lower your exposures at home for you and your family. So there's a lot we can do here. Let's get into that. I'm just going to grab a quick drink of water. Okay, this might surprise you, but the number one thing to offset the artificial is to connect to the natural. There's plenty of natural EMFs which are healthy and good. And this picture in the middle um, is actually of a cat on a beach in Mexico with my daughter, and they are getting the sunrise into their eyes, onto their skin. Their bare feet are touching the water and the sand. They're grounding to the earth. 
And they're also interacting with each other in a fun way. All extremely healthy things that we can do to offset. Uh, with respect to the sun, there's a lot of misinformation out there about the sun. A lot of people are really overly scared about the sun. This is a chart from a 2016 study that looked at 29,000 29, Swedish women, and it compared any of the causes uh, of their death, all-cause mortality, against their overall sun exposure. And the lower their sun exposure, the greater their chance of all-cause mortality, which means death from any cause. So sunlight is, is very healthy for us, okay? Nobody is saying you need to, you know, go to the equator and stand out in the noonday sun um, for an hour. You know, that would, that would probably not go well for most of us. But getting full spectrum sunlight, working ourselves up to being able to tolerate it without getting burnt is a very important part of the health recipe. And this, this chart over here shows the 37th parallel. And if you are to the, closer to the equator from that in the winter months, you're still going to get full spectrum sunlight. If you're north of that, like everyone in this room, you've got some problems. So. You want to keep that in mind, plan some vacations during the winter down below that 37th parallel so that you can get some full spectrum sunlight on your body. Uh, but that's really number one. This helped me incredibly when I recovered from my electrosensitivity. So that's why I have it as number one for you. Uh, just a real quick teaser here, a quote from Dr. Jack Cruz. He's talking about 5G, but he, he really means any EMF. Uh, but there's, there's these products you may have seen out there, like stickers and harmonizers and crystals that purport to harmonize and make all EMF radiation safe and healthy. And it's just not so. It's not that easy. So he's mentioning a, a concept from physics called the inverse square law here. And this is super helpful when we're thinking about our homes and how to lower our exposure. But the inverse square law says that as radiation spreads out, as it leaves a source, like a light bulb or a Wi-Fi router or a blender, whatever it might be, it spreads out, it dilutes, right? But it actually does it in an exponential way. So if you double the distance, if you go from one foot away to two feet away, the intensity of the radiation goes down by one, one quarter. So 75% reduction, right? And if you, if you go from two feet to four feet, the radiation is 1 16th what it used to be. So a little increase in distance is a massive drop off in your exposure. So it's called the inverse square law. It's a really important concept. Number three. Detection meters. So everybody should have their own set of quality consumer level meters. I have some for sale in the back. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about them. You can test them out. But you can't make changes in your environment without knowing what the effect was. So it's really important to have a meter uh, so that you can spend money on remediations that are actually effective. Number four, external threats. So it's, it's one thing to address what's going on inside your house, but a lot of this EMF radiation can come in from outside, and there's many sources, right, like a utility smart meter. Did you know that I have uh, smart water meters and smart gas meters, too? Mm -hmm. Those are rolling out. Power lines, of course. Uh, 5G towers, like we showed. Larger 4G towers. We talked about exterior artificial lighting and how that can bleed through and disrupt our body's sense of timing and circadian rhythm. And then these on the power pole, this transformer. Did you know you share that with two or three other houses? It's a, path, it's a common pathway. So if there's a big EMF issue in your neighbor's house, that does have a pathway into your house. So being aware of what's around you is important, and it can increase your sense of urgency and your index of suspicion and how much action you should be taking. Okay, but let's get back inside the house now. Number five, eliminating wireless. This is hands down 
the biggest bang for the buck that you can do. Because of the ubiquitousness of wireless technology, this is the big one. And the minimum starting point, I would encourage you, is to turn all wireless off at night. So your routers, your TVs, your Comcast box, your cell phone, your laptop, whatever it might be that uses Wi-Fi currently, go ahead and shut that down at night. You don't need it. It's going to impact your sleep in a very positive way, I can almost guarantee you. So that's the starting point if you're curious about jumping down this EMF rabbit hole. Really the gold standard is a hardwired connection, like an old-fashioned hardwired connection. It's called Ethernet. It's faster, it's healthier, and it's more secure than Wi-Fi. So <clears throat> on my website I've just released a, a pretty in-depth article on Ethernet all the things you need to know about it, and then how to implement it, what to buy, how to connect everything. And it's a lot easier than you might think. You don't have to be a techie to pull it off. So check out my blog and my website for that. Um, other ways you can help eliminate wireless is don't be an early adopter of gadgets and new technology. This is like an arms race in these new devices, new phones, um, you know, wireless uh, headphones, all these devices in our home are just more and more radiation and higher and higher power. So we don't want to be early adopters with these devices. I know we like our tech sometimes, but it's really got a downside. It's really, it's not a good relationship to be in, um, ultimately, to be that early adopter. Okay, the next, create easy on and off points. What do I mean by that? I mean, like in your TV area, you got your TV, maybe a game console, your cable box, you know, maybe some other wireless, plug those all onto the same power strip and when you're not watching TV there's one button to press and all of those will turn off and no more transmission. And then when you sit down you can turn it back on, watch your program and then turn it back off. It really simplifies and you can do this in your office and other parts of the house as well. Um, regarding cell phones, this is a big one. It's so close to your body most of the time, right? It's in your pocket, um, up to your ear. Some people put it in their bra. So it's strong radiation and it's very close to your body. So here's what I recommend. Use it on speaker, speakerphone. So hold it out at arm's length when you need to make your call. You can set it on a counter. Just use that inverse square law. Get it a little bit away from your body. Um, don't have it on when it's in your pocket. Put it in a purse, a backpack, if it absolutely has to be near you, but create a little distance. And then understanding airplane mode is a big one, and I'd, I'd like to show you this. There's some misconceptions about airplane mode. Uh, this, shot, this slide shows us on the left, these three images are all um, situations where your phone might show an airplane icon, you might think it's in airplane mode, but your phone has multiple antennas, which you can see here. Cellular, a Bluetooth, a wireless, there's some other ones, but these are the majors. And you'll find, sometimes you can press that airplane button, and these will still be blue or white. This is an iPhone. And that means they're still looking to connect. They're still connected or looking to connect. True airplane mode, looks like this on a phone. You can see now the difference. We have a slash and we have the airplane. And sometimes you're going to have to go into your actual settings to make this happen. So don't be tricked. Don't be tricked by this. Okay, extended use areas in your home. Where do you spend a lot of time? Your office, your living room, your kitchen. Um, we'll talk about the bedroom in a minute. But if you have meters, you can assess those areas for hot spots, and then you can make changes. You can unplug things, you can move certain things around, you can rearrange where a desk is to get yourself out of that hot spot zone in a room. Um, a couple of other tips when you're using a laptop, use it on battery. Don't use it plugged in. That is increasing your exposure, particularly to electric fields. Uh, when you touch it, if it's plugged into power. So use it on battery. Retrain your brain. So when you get up to get coffee or go to the bathroom, you plug it back in so you can maintain that charge. And then when you sit back down, 
unplug it, and keep working. Um, let's see. Grounding adapters can be very useful. I've got some of these in the back if you're curious. These can be very helpful for your computer and office gear. We've got um, air tube headsets. So this is a safer type of headset. It has a hollow plastic tube right before your ear, which is here, so that only sound comes up. Uh, this this uh, metal wire in here can propagate a signal from your phone. Wireless signal can jump onto this. The battery discharging can jump onto this, and that comes right up by your brain. Um, and these are, of course, much safer than a, wire, a full wireless headset. Uh, which is a very strong source of Bluetooth and also uses a magnetic field so that the left can talk to the right, which goes right through your noggin. So, a couple of, of things that you can use in your home. Um, shielding, shielding for power strips, shielding for extension cords. I have some of those in the back as well. Reducing artificial light or um, kind of rethinking how you use light, but light bulbs, incandescent, is still really the best of the human-made type of lighting. I'm very sorry if you just bought 27 LED bulbs at $8.99 each, uh, but those have a lot of issues associated with them. And the good old-fashioned incandescent is the safest uh, in regards to human-made light. Screens. This is, this is just like a light bulb in terms of the EMF profile. Your phone is too. Um, so there's very good software for laptops. It's called Iris. You can look that up. Um, that will reduce flicker. It will reduce the amount of blue light coming off the screen. And you can set it so that as the day progresses, the color temperature of the screen gets warmer and healthier, more like a candle than like the noonday sun, which is better biologically. And then these, blue blocking glasses. So these are great to have or after the sun goes down in particular. And these filter out the blue light that's coming from these lights that would otherwise tell my body it's earlier in the day, it's time to be more awake and more active. And there's a whole host of processes that occur in your body based on where it thinks the sun is in the sky. So you can see why seeing light that looks like the noonday sun right before you go to bed may have some implications on your sleep quality. <clears throat> Okay, and, and sleep is huge. We spend so much time sleeping. We all know it's an important place to heal, to recover, for our body to do housekeeping, etc. So I would encourage you, and, and this is what I work with my clients on, is to create a sleep sanctuary. And so we want to reduce artificial lighting that we see two hours before bedtime. You know, switch to orange or red or candle type lighting. Um, your bedroom should be completely dark at night. You don't want that bedside clock blasting you all night. You don't want the street light coming through the blinds at night. Even just a few photons of light can upset that circadian timing and sense that your body has. Um, social media as well, right? This can be very agitating and arousing and not, not in a good way, um, which can affect your sleep. Um, and then there should be no tech in the room. You shouldn't 